Hey everyone, Kevin from MechanicalAdvantage.com. For the part that I have on the screen, in my latest couple of videos, you've seen me take a 2D print and show you the process for how I would go about modeling this part. And then uh, in the next video, I toolpath the part so that I can take this out to the machine and run it. And that's what I'm gonna do in this video. We're gonna go out to the garage, we're gonna chuck a chunk of raw material into the sile out there and we're gonna hit cycle start and make this part and go through the setups. I have a few things I have to do before I'm ready for that process. So I just wanna talk about what I'm gonna do first. I've got setup one active. I'm gonna expand this and I'm gonna click on this. And one of the things that I do before I run a program is I just simulate what I'm gonna be running. So for this program, I know that I'm gonna face it. I'm gonna spot drill it. I'm then gonna drill the holes, and then I'm gonna drill the 3 s hole, rough out the inside and finish the inside, so this will take just a second to get done. So I expect this to happen. And then for the outside operation, it's gonna rough and finish the outside, and then it's gonna perform the chamfering operations. I like to know in my mind what the, what the program is gonna do. So say if it grabbed in setup one, if it grabbed a shear hog, I would say to myself, why is it grabbing a shear hog? I didn't use that tool in this program. So I just take a little mental inventory of what I expect to happen. You can also print out setup sheets, but since I'm the same person that programs the machine and runs it, I often don't do setup sheets for myself. So I'm happy with that. I'm gonna exit the simulation. Another piece of information I wanna take note of, when we post out the code in Fusion, and maybe I'll see if I can take a little video of this when I get it loaded in the machine, the G-code will show us the deepest that a tool goes. I don't care how deep any of the drills go. I care about how deep the 3 8 inch tool goes, but not on the inside. I know it's gonna go all the way through the stock on the inside, I care about how deep it goes on the outside. So if I were to go and find my deepest tool path, which should be this 2D adapter right here, I might simulate this operation and then just go through and now I'm cutting at the deepest level right there. I can go to the info tab and see what my Z position is. So you can see that I'm gonna go negative 0.821 and that's gonna allow me to go to the machine, load up that tool, set my work offsets, and then go to that coordinate for Z depth to make sure that I'm gonna clear my vice jaws before I start running this program. Um, if you wanna see the process of how I do that, I'll put a little card or maybe a link in the description to a video that shows you how I set up a program for the first time when I'm on the machine to ensure that I'm gonna not crash into my vice jaws and cut through anything. So I'm gonna check this number, negative 0.821 on the machine to make sure that I'm gonna clear the top of my vice jaws before I run this part. And if I'm not gonna, then I'm gonna have to come in here and make some adjustments. So I'm happy with that. The last thing I need to do is um, take a look at my tool library. I'm gonna go to my manage library and say tool library. and now now if I click on my cylinder, here you can see the tools I'm using. And I'm glad I looked, I've got a problem. My tool holder, my tool changer only holds 12 tools and I'm using 13 in this program. If we look, we can see I'm not using tools three or four and I'm not using tool number 10. So what I'm gonna do is for this program, I'm gonna change 13 to be one of the unused tools. And I think what I'll do is I'll use 10. Now I could do that here or I could go to my second setup and find that adaptive operation. I'm gonna right click on that and say edit tool for the one that's tool 13, go to my post processor tab, and then I can just use my arrow down buttons or type it in and hit accept. And now I've got a tool number 10 that's in this um, program. So with that, I'm just gonna click on my first setup, hit G1, G2. It tells me it's gonna post my Sile X7 post that I use, the program name, I'll just call this cylinder one for my first setup. It's gonna go to my thumb drive that I have. I can hit this button to reselect the path if I want to. And the other thing for me I wanna make sure is I don't want this to preload a tool because I've got an umbrella style tool changer and the tool's gotta to come out of the same pocket it goes back into before a tool can be changed. So I wanna make sure that's unchecked. And when I'm happy with that, I'm also not gonna open the NC file in an editor. I'm just gonna hit post and it's gonna post that program out. And you can see it posted it. Now I'll go to my second setup. I can post process that. All the same settings, cylinder two. The other thing you can do is you can look at your operations and see what you have selected. You can see here I've got my second setup and the tool pass associated with that selected. So I'm making sure I'm getting the right thing. I'll post it. I'll go to my setup. Uh, this is the third one it's named for because I must have canceled one of the setups along the way. And I can just say post process again on the toolbar. And this will be cylinder C-Y-L-I-N-D-E-R if I can spell three. And we'll post that. And then we'll go to the final one 
and I'm gonna post process that. Notice that time I did it from the right click menu, which is a common way for me to do it. C-Y-L-I-N-D-E-R, and we'll call that four. And I'll hit post. And now I've got all my programs. I've verified the order of operations in the simulation before starting this video. I'm ready to go and chuck this material up in the vise, set some work coordinate systems, and start running this part. And uh, I'll take you out to the garage, and we'll get some footage of that process. I wanted to start out by showing you something that I do. You can see that tool is almost touching the part. It's kind of my reference and it looks like it's in the top dead center. So I just gave that a quick check to make sure that my Heimer set uh, my X, Y, Z, my X, Y, zero, correct? That Z is a different thing that's showing me that it's correct. And now if I come and I look at my controller, you can see that I've got X and Y are at zero and I'm about a, a thousandths of an inch higher than my Z plane. And I had a little piece of paper out here and I can barely stick it underneath there. If I go down one, so that tells me I'm right where I wanna be on my Z height as well. And so that's just kind of how I start the program, just with the visual check to make sure that everything is looking like it's supposed to be where it's at. I also put in the deepest tool, the one that's gonna go over the vice jaws and check to make sure that I have clearance and I've got the clearance I need so I'm ready to go and load the program and start running this. Here I'm gonna start out with a four flute, two inch diameter face mill, skimming 10 thousandths of an inch off the top of the part. Pretty fast operation. Apologize, I'm trying to keep the coolant off of the camera. Um, I thought I maybe had it, but as soon as it gets on those flutes, it just flings it everywhere. You can see it even got this camera way over in the corner. Uh, switch out. Now we're going to go and switch to the spot drill where it's going to spot the eighth inch holes, the number seven holes, and the three eighths hole in the center. You're going to see me reach my hand in here in a second and try to adjust. There I wiped off the camera, didn't really help, and then tried to adjust the coolant line a little bit. and. Uh, yeah, now we'll go and see. I didn't quite get it, but it's close enough. There's plenty of coolant flowing across that surface for what the spot drill is going to do. And so we're just going to spot the two eighth inch holes, and that puts the chamfer on the top at the same time. And then we're going to spot the 4.201 and the 3 eighth inch hole, so that you're going to see five spots appear. And that's going to wrap up the spotting operation. Now it's going to switch over. It's gonna grab the eighth inch drill. And I really missed the coolant on this one. And I might not have had my speed perfect. This helicoptered a little bit. Um, not too bad, we're only going 3 16 of an inch deep. So it, it, it turned out fine. But if you look at the top of the drill when it's done, you can see that there'll be a little, little chips wrapped up on the shank. Maybe we'll see it better in a future shot along the way. Now we're gonna switch over to the number 7.201 drill. And we're gonna drill all the way through the part. So it's probably going at roughly 800 thousandths of an inch deep. We're gonna pack. I'm gonna try to adjust the coolant line on this one a little bit better after seeing what happened with the eighth inch drill that just happened. And uh, we'll drill. Now one of the things I might have changed if I would have paid more attention is there's an accumulated pecking depth. So once it goes so deep, it gets gonna come all the way out of the hole to clean the chips and then go back and start uh, pecking again. That rest of the hole that it's pecking is a very minute distance. And so I probably would have been better off just to let it peck all the way down and not do that retract, but it doesn't really take that long and everything worked out just fine. So we're gonna go through and this is the last 0.201 drill. And then it's gonna switch over and do the 3 8 inch drill. Um, this doesn't take very long to do either. And this hole is gonna go all the way through the bottom of the stock. Now I'm switching to the 3 8 inch, 3 flutes, melon tool, which is then owned by Walter. It's got the little chip splitters that we'll talk about more in this video, show that uh, a little bit. And I just ramped right, just plunged right down the center 3 8 hole and started spiraling out. 
it's going to get a little bit better. Some of the coolant got on the screen again. Um, in a minute, that's going to clear itself and you're going to see a little bit more. I think I need to do an air knife for this thing. Maybe, maybe I can talk to Edge Precision and he can uh, loan me his plans for the one that he made for his GoPro. This tool had no problem. The spindle never bogged whatsoever during this process. Um, the chips were, you can kind of see them fall off the front of the machine. You can see how small they are. They're a good sized chip, but they're broken into chunks. Um, so they wash away really nicely. And so I'm happy with that. The surface finish maybe isn't quite as good as what you can get with a traditional end mill, but the chip control is much better. There it's just doing the 2D contour on the outside again. It's going to get better and now it's going to start roughing the very outside of the part. It did the 2D contour on the inside of the hole, I should say. Now it's going to rough the outside. And you'll see splashes come and go. Again, I'll try to work on this in future videos to make this better. I'm a programmer and a CAD guy, so this, this camera stuff is a challenge for me that I'm working my way through. And I'll have some people that can help me make this better as well. There it's just doing the 2D contour and we're done with the with the 3 8 inch end mill. Not a lot to go on this program left. It's gonna switch over to the two flute chamfer mill. And I'm just gonna do just a tiny edge break on this, 10,007 inch. So just trying to do a little 10,007 inch edge break just to get rid of the sharp edge. This is gonna made up to another part. So I didn't wanna put the big 20,007 inch um, edge break that the print called out for. That would have been fine. It would have been functionally fine. I just wanted to look more aesthetically pleasing when everything's bolted together so I didn't see that seam as much. It's gonna go and do the hole and then when it gets done with this bore, it's gonna finish up the last three and that will wrap up the first operation. All right, there's the first operation done. Things look pretty decent. Um, you can see the surface finish with that chip splitter end mill maybe isn't the absolute best, but it's still pretty good. And uh, let's see if I can show you what that chip splitter end mill looks like. Uh, there's our tool. If we spin it, you should be able to see the little notches. Like there's a notch, if you look on the left side of the tool, those little notches help to break the chips up into more manageable chunks so the coolant can push them out easier and get them into my chip bin. So this is a first time for me trying this tool with these little notches that are inside. But Op 1 came out, everything looks good, and I'm ready to turn it over. For the second side now, you see I have a hat of material I have to get rid of. So what I'm going to do is Z off of this surface against a set of parallels that I'll put down into the vice jaw and then clamp down on it. And then I'll touch off for my very first op. I could use the center of that bore if I want to, but I'm just gonna touch off on the hat of stock and then I'll use the shear hog. All that operation is gonna do is take off the bulk of the material and then do a facing pass across it to get it to thickness. And then once that's done, I'll bring it back and show you where I'm going to touch off next in the last operation for the, si for the second side of the part. Here you can see the shear hogs didn't come down. I've got this gripped fairly well on the vise, so I wasn't really worried about it pulling out or anything like that. Um, this is that 10,000 RPM, 10,000 feet per tooth. So it's taking a pretty good amount of material and now it's already into the facing operation. So this tool path really doesn't take very long to complete. And that is all this operation is gonna do. So you can see the shear hog made pretty quick work of it. All I have to do now is come in and touch my X off this side and my Y off that back face and I am ready to do a chamfer tool path and finish the majority of the machining before I stand it up and drill the holes and tap each side. Again, this is just gonna be the two flute chamfer mill, 10,000 seven inch chamfer. I just copied the tool path from the other side and it's just gonna do a quick deburring operation basically on this. It doesn't take very long at all. It's gonna do the outside, the four holes and 
the bore that's in the center, and this operation will be done. So there is the bulk of the part finished, and I'm going to be honest, that last video clip you saw was a little bit of a redo. If you remember when I did the cam and I forgot to chamfer one of the holes, I guess I forgot to fix that, and I posted it, and one of the holes didn't get chamfered, so I ran in quick, added that final hole that didn't get chamfered, and re-ran the program. So the only thing that really cut in the video that you watched was the one hole that I did chamfer. But uh, there's what the part looks like right now. You can see it's completely finished. Now I'm going to stand it up and drill the holes on the top side and the bottom side. I'm going to start out with my spot drill and I'm just going to do a 50,000 depth hole. I believe is what I used for all three of those. That didn't take very long. I just put a spot there and now it's going to switch over to the uh, 159 diameter drill. That's the tap size for 1032. Just gonna pack in, doesn't take very long to do these, and that's now done. And then it's gonna switch over and we'll grab the tap operation. Again, the tool changer, phenomenal job. Never worry about it, it just works every time. We're gonna go and tap this hole. You're gonna see for a second, I assume that the spindle has to find the right spot to start one, and once it picks up on that spot, then it goes into that tapping motion. And then I found the spot again, taps it, everything came out just great. Chips pushed out the top, no problem. And the last drilling operation is going to switch back to that 3 8 inch drill one more time. And it's just going to drill uh, through hole through the center of the bore, not all the way through the part, but just through the center of the bore. And this doesn't take very long at all. It's already done. Now it's going to switch. I only chamfered the 3 8 inch hole. The two uh, tapped holes, I just used a Noga deburring tool for that. It was just as easy without trying to do the math and everything you have to do in Fusion to, to chamfer a tapped hole. So I, when I was done with the part, I just took it out and used that Noga deburring tool to do the tapped holes. And there you can see this, this setup is complete. Got the holes drilled and tapped in the eighth inch hole, a three eighth inch hole put through there and then chamfered it. When I set my Z X, I set it off this surface, the Y was off the back surface and the Z was off the top surface. And I ran a parallel across the vice jaws and pushed the part up against that. So now all I have to do is flip this part over and then I will run the same program again and we'll get the next side drilled and tapped. And I don't have to set up any work ordinance system for that since everything is symmetrical about this.
there we have it. There's our finished part. Uh, ran the program that you guys all saw me do with the exception of forgetting to champ for that one hole and fixing that. But that's result of part number one. Come back for the next part, which is going to be the cylinder head. I'm back in my office. You saw the part completed out in the machine. We ran all four operations. Everything came out pretty good. I'm gonna put some pictures on the screen here in a second, um, but I wanted to make some notes. Things I know, my lighting could be better. My audio could be better. My camera work could be better. I am generally a programmer and a designer, and that's what I excel at. And the photography aspect and the audio aspect and the video aspect is all something that I need to work on getting better at. That being said, here are some pictures of the finished part. You can see that it came out really good for size. The overall length of this part was 2.375, so we're almost right there on that size. The, the, the dimension that was probably off the most is the width of the part. It's supposed to be 1.875, and you can see I got 1.876, so I was a thousandths off in that direction. And then I'll pop over the thickness. The target thickness of this part was 0.781, and I got a target thickness of 0.7815. So, um, and that's with the caliper, just doing it by hand. So I feel pretty good that uh, I came well within the tolerance that was listed on the part for each of these dimensions. Another thing to note is that I didn't use cutter comp on this part at all. I just programmed it as the nominal size diameter. I often get questions from people about how dimensionally accurate the sile is, and that should be a good example right there about how dimensionally accurate it is. All of my parts on aluminum that I've done so far have come out great. They pretty much hit spot on all the time. Um, I don't even, I haven't had a whole lot of parts that I've needed to w worry about doing cutter comp on, but that'll probably be something I'll work on in an upcoming video. So uh, love to hear your guys' feedback on the video again. I'm open to, to criticism, and I know uh, that there are parts of this video that could be a lot better. I'm learning it. I'll get better over time, and if anybody has any tips or tricks or equipment or things you think I should use, um, I'd love to hear about that. You can leave that information down in the comments below. The next video for this drops pretty soon. It'll, it should appear on the 22nd of January, starting with the CAD. Then we'll go into the CAM, and we'll follow up with the machining one more time. And that will be released the following Saturday, after the 22nd, ready to go that time. Um, so I hope you guys like this. Again, if you have any comments, questions, please drop them in the comments section below, or you can send me an email to kevin at mechanicaladvantage.com. And as always, thanks for watching.